Uncle Connor. Thanks, Brady. Hey, everybody. My name's Connor Lenahan, and I'm here to talk to you about a topic near and dear to my heart, phlogiston theory. Now, phlogiston theory is a topic I came across where, as you do on a Friday night, I was reading about the history of science, and I came across a man by the name of Humphrey Davy. Humphrey Davy is a scientist who would go on to become the head of the British Royal Society, but when he was 20, he worked for a health clinic where his job was to invent new gases and then immediately put them into his body and see if they made him healthier. Uh, while doing Doing this process, he discovered a gas called nitrous, and he immediately fell in love with it. Uh, to the point where, after two experiments with it, he just kicked off the world's first nitrous bender. Now, a quick word of warning about this, as fun as inventing gases can be, don't try this at home. He managed to invent a couple different gases that would, for instance, turn to acid when he ingested them and knock him out for four straight hours. Uh, he once came out of one of those uh, saying, I think I might live. Uh, so, don't do this at home. But anyway, he becomes obsessed with nitrous mainly because he finds it's an experience that he can't internalize or speak about. He doesn't have the language to talk about it. And he does an interesting thing. He starts inviting everyone he knows that it's an artist, musician, and painter over, giving them nitrous, and then having somebody record their thoughts as they come out of the nitrous experience. And the paper that he writes, instead of just being on the science, is half about the social experience. Now I thought, that looks like a hell of a paper to read, I'm going to look it up, and immediately got distracted by the word deflogisticated nitrous air. What the hell does deflogisticated mean? So, a quick trip to Wikipedia, and I start reading into the history of something called phlogiston theory. Phlogiston theory is first proposed by this dude right here, and the idea is that when something burns, there is an element, phlogiston, that is being separated from the thing that gets burnt. Now, this isn't what really happens, but what's interesting is phlogiston theory worked. For 100 years, from about 1700 to 1800, people used this to do real science. This is how nitrogen was discovered, for instance. And other really interesting connections started to get made. For instance, people started realizing that the thing that we breathe out of our body is the thing that's getting eaten by plants, and then it's getting back into our body uh, through other processes like when we eat this. Now, we thought that we were breathing out phlogistons, plants were eating the phlogiston, and then that's why plants could burn, but so it goes. So this guy right here, Antoine, I can't actually say his name, so we're just going to read it. But uh, what he does is he sits down and he starts going, hey, wait a second, we've connected all these different processes about phlogiston, except this weird thing is happening when metals get phlogistonated or dephlogistonated, they gain weight. That doesn't make any sense if an element is leaving it. So he does these very, very careful measurements, figures out exactly how much weight these elements are gaining, and then looks for an answer. In England, Joseph Priestley discovers what he calls deflogisticated air. It's oxygen. So our French friend, whose name I can't pronounce, he makes the connection, and this leap, he comes up with the theory of combustion, the oxygen theory of combustion. And this leads to a huge scientific revolution. This is how people realize, or this is how he realized that chemistry needed to be standardized. He comes up with the first table of elements. He figures out how to uh, standardize the practice of studying chemistry and distributing that information. And right before the French Revolution, where he was beheaded by a guillotine, he publishes his paper, and the world gets its chemistry start. Now, what's really interesting is looking at how that time, uh, it takes time for that information to disseminate. We go back to that paper from the beginning. Look, it talks about nitrous oxide. They knew about oxygen when nitrous got discovered, but they had to list both the phlogisticated and oxide so that people could understand what's going on. There was a paradigm shift taking place, and it took time. The scientists had a model that worked, and they were hesitant to give up something that worked for something that was new. Now, why do we care about a bunch of dudes in the 1700s being wrong about something? Uh, I mean, you know, that can be a pretty boring thing, though the history of science is interesting and not boring. But where I like this is that this is a really good way to look at your own mental models and to start asking yourself the question, where's my phlogiston? What do I have in my life that works as a model getting by day to day, but is actually harmful or just doesn't make sense? There's something better out there. I really like to think about things like to toxic masculinity. From 20 to 25, I was just angry at everybody and I got by just fine because I'm a white dude. Turns out that's not the best way to go forward in the world and treat everyone well. 
Thank you all so much for listening to my ramble. I'm Connor Lodahan.